Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR Podcast. I'm your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I am really excited to be joined by Annette Revis. Annette is the Chief People Officer at Envoy, and we're going to talk about her work at Envoy, her past experience at Facebook, and her career, and so much more. So Annette, thanks so much for joining us. Um, I'd love to have you start off with an introduction for the audience. Absolutely. My name's Annette Revis, and I'm the Chief People Officer for Envoy, and I'm excited to be here today. Okay, so let's talk about your background because you know, it's so interesting. I think some guests um, come from a full career in HR. Many more guests, especially uh, you know these days, have kind of moved in and out of the field. You didn't start your career in HR. You actually started in kind of tax and finance before making that transition. What what drew you to the uh, the wonderful world of, of HR and kind of pulled you away from finance? Yeah, I did. I started my career in public accounting where really that's when I learned my foundation for client support and how to really drive change through the business. Even back in those early days, I did things from the HR space. So I planned all the events. I did all the recruiting. I did all of that stuff touching on HR. As I went through my career in finance, I knew that there was a part of me that I was not using. And it was that part that really what I consider my secret sauce is coaching and mentoring. Um, I came from a family of teachers, educators. My dad had a PhD in education focused on counseling. And really that's what I do best. And so I took the foundation of finance and really from a business perspective, and then made that transition into being an HRVP where I could help leaders, I could coach and mentor them, but then I could also help them run their businesses. So it gave me a little bit of a unique edge. Um, and I've been doing that for a long time. Yeah. Well, did you make that move within a company or did you kind of decide to, you wanted to make that shift and switch companies to make that shift? Because I, you know, I think a lot of times when you're making that transition within a company, you're kind of a known commodity. They know yep. your strengths, they know your abilities. It's a more natural, or actually it's natural, but an easier perhaps uh, transition into a different discipline. Yep. So I actually, I was finance and then I managed my doctor's office for a few years because I was done with tech. It was the second dot boom and I was laying people off, including myself. And so I went and managed my doctor's office and everyone reported up to me, including doctors and nurses. And so again, more space around the HR space. And then I was trying to make that um, transition just outside, trying to find a job and it was really hard. And so I actually went back in public accounting. They gave me the first break and I could do HR and public accounting because I understood the business, but, and understood the people. And so they trusted me to take on that role. So that's how I did it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting when I was, uh, you know, preparing for the podcast, uh, obviously I get a chance to, to look at uh, guests backgrounds on LinkedIn and uh, read things that they've written and, and just get a sense of, uh, you know, what drives them. And there was something that stood out to me in your LinkedIn headline, which I'd love to talk to you about. And that was, uh, you know, it was a great headline, uh, but there was two words in there that really stood out to me. Truth teller. Yeah. And I think, you know, the, especially today, right, the, the field that we're working in, in HR is so volatile and unpredictable and unstable often. Um, and it's got, you know, some highs and lately more than a fair share of, of lows. And I think when you think about that relationship between the chief people officer and the CEO specifically, that ability for the CPO to be a truth teller and a truth teller when at times that truth is not a popular uh, position to have is is difficult, but it's it's hugely important. And so I'd love to get your perspective, like what when you kind of frame truth teller, what, what does that mean to you? So for me, what that means is showing up with always telling the truth, but coming from a place of love. And so you've heard, I know a hundred times, you know, hard feedback, tough love, all those pieces. You can be guaranteed that that's going to be my role in any role that I've had. And so working with those clients, building those relationships with the most senior people in the organization, for example, at Facebook, my role there was to take leaders from good to great, great to greater. And I could only do that if I could tell them the truth and be really honest with them, both about themselves, about the team, about where we were going. So people would say about Annette, she's tough, she cares deeply, and she will always, always tell you the truth. Yeah. I mean, do you have any advice for other people leaders who, you know, I think you know, we, we, we say that term telling the truth, like it's an easy thing to do and, and you yeah. know, it is, but it, it can also be really difficult, especially for more junior people leaders who, you know, they, they may be working with the CEO, they may be working with 
uh, executives at a level that they haven't interfaced with before. And it's, it's hard sometimes to have that confidence to push back, especially when it's hard truths, right? And it, it's difficult news. Yeah. Um, what advice would you have for maybe earlier career people leaders who are still kind of building that, that truth telling muscle and the confidence to be able to, 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 to communicate in that way, even when it's difficult? Yeah, the most important thing from my perspective is first to build the relationship. You need to build the relationship with who you need to be a truth teller to. So you can't walk in day one and say, guess what? Everything's broken. You need to fire everyone, you know, right. fire yourself. I mean, there's so many things, right? But once you have that relationship, then they depend on you. Actually, you're building that relationship. So they depend on you to bring them the truth. So really it's having the relationship, making sure you're balancing truth telling with solutions. So I never showed up and just said, here's where it is. I showed up and said, here's where it is and here's what we should do about it. Here's options for you. Here's how we can drive change. And so I think the relationship and then being solutions driven while you're telling the truth, no matter if you're junior or senior, anywhere in that stack with anyone you're supporting, again, no matter if they're junior or senior, is what I found to be very successful and what I coach the people on my team to do. Yeah, well, I want to talk about your new role at Envoy, but before we do, I want to, you know, you spent a decade at Facebook, as you mentioned, um, you know, prior to moving into your new role. Looking back on that experience, obviously you were there for um, tremendous periods of growth. You were there for, uh, you know, lots of kind of highs and lows of, of you know, uh, uh, evolution within the business. Um, when you look back at your time at Facebook, what 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 one kind of accomplishment or or project or initiative um, stands out to you the most? Yeah, so one of the things that Facebook is great about focusing on is hiring diverse talent, but they would not um, go faster on the curve with bringing inclusion training, in particular with managers and individuals, how to keep that talent included in the business. Because you can hire all the diverse talent you want to, but it doesn't matter if they don't stay. And what I found was people were coming to me to be coached and mentored, and they didn't feel included. And so I worked with a friend of mine who has a diversity a consulting practice, and we developed a training that we did with our teams and then across the company in order around inclusion. And it really started with me stepping up and being very vulnerable about who I am, how we define diversity, what you don't know about me, what you don't see, to get them to really think about their own bias and what they bring to the table when they're trying to include diverse talent. We were able to see the numbers for my teams for um, that talent staying to go up and then more importantly, be able to get into the director ranks by really setting a strong foundation with those managers. I'm really proud of that work. Yeah, you know, and I, I'm so glad you raised that point because I think, you know, particularly when you look at the how the field of HR has evolved over the last, you know, a couple of years specifically, I think the, the way that we think about and talk about and hopefully plan for um, building more equitable um, and inclusive and representative organizations uh, is evolving. And I think p part of it goes back to, well, not part of it, much of it goes back to just, you know, like society, our workplaces are fraught with systemic inequity. And, and I think that we, we are starting to have different conversations in HR about our role in, uh, in educating ourselves seeing the inequity, dismantling the inequity, naming it. Um, and I'd love to get your thoughts. Obviously, it sounds like that was a, a productive um, initiative at Facebook. What advice might you have for other HR leaders that are out there that are you know, really kind of committed to building more equitable organizations uh, and, and maybe don't necessarily understand their role in place in kind of identifying and dismantling systemic inequity? Yeah, I think the first thing is kind of ask yourself who you are and check your own bias. And I know that's, uh, you know, kind of you think, is that the place to start? But really understanding how you show up, how are you coaching and mentoring your managers? You don't need a program, right? You What you need to be able to do is identify what some of those problems are. I love that word dismantling because that's really what we're trying to do is break down those barriers. So understand who you are, what are your own bias, and then coach your managers. When you see it, name it. Don't get stuck in process. Don't say, well, you know, there's this chain. Go and have the conversation directly. Talk to that manager. When people come talk to you, 
try to empathize and understand where they are, but again, drive to action, what needs to happen. And so a lot of it can happen with coaching and mentoring one-on-one, because one-on-one will solve this problem, right? If, yeah. every, if every single one of us spent a few hours you know, in a week could to solve the problem, the problem would be solved. So step up and make sure you're having those conversations. Yeah, I appreciate that advice. Um, let's talk about your role now. You know, you, you spent yeah. 10 years, as you mentioned, at Facebook. Uh, you're now the chief people officer at Envoy. What compelled you to join Envoy? I mean, you had a, a tremendous background. I'm sure you had a lot of opportunities and things that you you could have done next in your career. Um, yeah. the, as we know, the market for HR leaders is, uh, you know, obviously it's shifting a bit now, but, you know, during the time you made that shift, uh, it was white hot. And so what, what was it about Envoy that kind of compelled you to join? Great question. I care deeply about the problem we're solving. I truly believe that people have to get out of their houses and back into the office in a hybrid way. And for me, hybrid and for us, hybrid means you spend part of the time in the office and part of the time at home. And that time in the office is around collaboration, working very cross-functionally, solving problems together. The only way we can have unstructured problem solving and unstructured laughter and unstructured joy is if we come together. Because when we're on Zoom, every single second is structured. And so Envoy not only gives me the opportunity to really help build that in the world through our product, because our product allows companies to do that, it also lets me set culture here to get people back in our office and work very closely with our leaders in order to set what is the future of workplace. We are really setting the foundation for what that future is. And like I said, it's that hybrid working collaboratively when you're together, working very focused when you're not. And so being able to be in a place, I'm very mission driven. Every job I've ever taken is because I care deeply about the product, what they're building, what the company is doing. And I I think this is really important to reset our future. Yeah, well, I think many uh, viewers and listeners who work in tech are probably familiar with Envoy. Um, I'd love for you to just give an overview of of the product. Uh, What what does the product do? How is it helping um, companies um, kind of create a a safe and sustainable uh, return to workplace? Yeah, our product's super cool. It's an app on your phone. And the app, what it allows is a few different things. One, to start from just safety, if you do track vaccinations, It allows you to input the vaccinations. It allows you to say who's safe to come in the office. It also then, once you get everyone coming back, allows you to assign desks. Because with hybrid, everyone's not there every single day. So you don't need a specific desk assigned to everyone. So you can come in. You can use the app for that. It allows you to, to book rooms and know which rooms are available, right? Again, all of these things are different because when everyone was coming in every day, you went to your desk, you went to the conference room, and now it allows you to build those things. It allows you to work collab- cross-functionally so you know who's in the office that day and where they're seated, seated, sit, where they're seated. And so, again, allowing people to come together in teams. We also have... Um, Neighborhood setup, we have neighborhood signs. So, you know, it's the Palace of HR kind of to play off San Francisco. Um, And there's different names like that. So teams can sit together and work together. And all of that is done within our app. Yeah, I mean, it's so fascinating because I remember, uh, you know, I was familiar with Envoy before the pandemic. And I think obviously when you when you look at the the use case for it in these times that we're in right now, right? Where we have just a whole different way of that we need to work while we're coming into physical locations. Yep. You know, it seems like the, the product has been so uniquely positioned to adapt and evolve to meet that need. Yep. Um, you, you mentioned kind of neighborhoods. Are you, uh, you know, the, the obligatory dog food question, are, are you doing anything, uh, you know, are you using Envoy in any kind of unique ways internally that maybe other HR uh, members of the audience who are Envoy customers might want to uh, emulate in their organizations? Yeah, the neighborhoods is one in particular because what we're trying to do is make sure it doesn't feel like we're seating people specifically because again, they're coming in the office you know, in a hybrid way, but we want to really make sure that we understand how people can work together. And then who are they sitting next to? Um, we're trying to get down even to that detail so we understand what day should we have the um, happy hour that we're going to have in the office, right? So we, we look at because people register and so there's attendance. So really looking at the app and using it as a way to build community is the next phase for us. And I think as people are looking at it, it's easy to say it just a science desk, but how is it helping to build that community by knowing who's here and even what events you can do? Yeah. Well, let's talk belonging 
for a little bit because I think I think you're right. I think most companies that had a, a workforce that was able to work remotely during the peak of the pandemic, and you know, yeah. I would say during the pandemic, like we're still in this; it's not over. Um, but you I know, want it to be over, Lars. I, I mean, we all right. We're like we, we've like every time we feel like we take a step forward. Know, there's this other too. variant that's uh, yeah. throwing a wrench in the work. So yeah. you know, for most of organizations, especially in tech, we're hybrid by default. And I think when you, it causes us in HR to have to rethink perhaps how we approach things like belonging, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of creating a space where, you know, when everybody is physically co-located, there's lots of things that you could do to, to help support and drive belonging in a hybrid world or in remote worlds. Uh, you can still do that, but it's different and you have to approach it differently. So how do you think about, um, you know, kind of building and strengthening a culture of belonging in your hybrid environment? Yeah, so for us, we have two versions of that. We have the hybrid environment where people can come in the office. And so for those teams that have local teams where people can come in the office, they really focus those days they are together to do events and be collaborative together. It gets tricky when you have remote talent, especially when you have remote talent that's part of a team that comes in the office. We also have, by the way, teams that are 100% remote. And again, that's a little bit easier, right? Because they're on Zoom together, so we make sure they have unstructured time as much as possible. They have happy hours together. They have, you know, each meeting starts with how are you, what's going on, right? So you can, you can have models for both. The hard model and what we continue to struggle with and focus on is how do you do it when you have people in the office to make sure that remote talent doesn't get left behind. And so we coach our managers a lot about Okay, when you're doing the water cooler talk, how many times have you touched base with your remote? If you have someone remote, when you're in the office, you're really a remote team. So making sure you're operating, even something as silly as follow-up notes, right? Because again, if you're all talking, you can just jot that stuff down. We're making good notes. We make sure too for teams that have remote that we don't continue the meeting after the meeting. Those are wow. all just tips that we give folks so that they remember if they are, rem if you have a one remote talent, you are a remote team and you need to operate that way. And that it sounds silly, like don't talk after the meeting, but yet how many times before did the Zoom go off and you were talking? And yeah. so we have to remind people because that's the water cooler talk that we want to make sure that we're not leaving people out of. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, I love the way you think kind of very intentionally about that, because I think, you know, there's no, you mentioned the conversations that carry on after Zoom, like, often there's no, you know, negative intent, there are people aren't saying, hey, you know, now this person's gone, we can right. we'll have this other conversation. I think it's just like the natural, like, we've all, people who've been working in an office are just accustomed to like, hey, yep. that wraps up. So, hey, I really like that point about X or Y. And it's like, that that is not inclusive. What do you think about people who are not privy to that Part of the conversation. And so I think, you know, you underscored a really good point that it's so important that we are very intentional about belonging and creating kind of async practices uh, that can support um, even the synchronous elements of meetings um, to ensure that the people that aren't in the room aren't, uh, aren't left out or missing elements of it. Um, yeah. You know, when you think about this new world of work we're building, um, there's so many things that are changing, but I think one of them is the way that we think about uh, employee wellness and well-being, and even yeah. more specifically kind of HR and or the organization's role in supporting that. And I think, you know, we, we began having different conversations about mental health specifically prior to the pandemic. And certainly now we're having very different conversations uh, about that. And obviously, you know, we've all are continuing to go through a, a generational pandemic and there are lots of scars visible and not um, that we all carry as a result you know of that and I'm curious to get your thoughts you know as an HR leader uh, what do you see kind of as HR's role in in supporting employee well-being and kind of maybe where do you where do you take that term when you think about employee well-being and kind of how it applies to your employees great question. Um, and part of the reason I want to go back to why I came to Envoy is I actually think it's, again, unhealthy for people to be in their houses all the time. I look at my kids and think, you know, they need to get out. They need to connect. We have seen all the studies about what's happened when people have been at home non-connecting. And so, again, I think it's really important to do this work. When I think about employee well-being in my role, in the people team's role, I think we have a very high role in trying to see around the corners, making sure my HRBP team is meeting with our talent all the time, not just managers. We spend time what I call full stack HR. We spend time with every person up and down the stack of the reporting chain so that we can make sure we understand what's going on with them. 
We also at Envoy have a credit for well-being. So, you know, we offer people a credit every single month. I think it's $100 where you can use that for if you want to do um, I'm on Weight Watchers, so I use my Weight Watchers in that credit, right? Or if you want to take a yoga class, and we really encourage it, and we track it, and we know who's kind of doing what to make sure that people are just taking care of themselves. And then finally, we coach our managers to see signs of people that are stressed um, or people that are just, you know, kind of pulled too far to the right, if you will, so that we can make sure we help them. And I would say also we have a tool. It's We used to use 15.5, now we use Lattice, where every week we ask people how they're doing, and we track that. We look at it. We make sure we understand. Again, not in a way that's like, tell us what's wrong, but more in a way of how are you doing and what can we do to help? And the people team really feels a responsibility in order to make sure that people are operating at their best. And a big part of that is well-being. Yeah, I mean, it's so interesting. You mentioned, you know, obviously two great tools that can support that. And I think the the way that we have um, shifted the way we think, you know, again, it wasn't long ago where we thought about, uh, you know, reviews in the context of an annual review. Yeah. And it was very performance oriented. And now it's just... Pulse checks, nudges, yep. uh, check-ins. There's so much uh, uh, more depth, I think, to how we think about how we kind of check in and support our employees. And I think it allows us to identify, um, you know, potential risks or trouble spots before they percolate and get bigger. And we can kind of have, uh, you know, actions that we can use to kind of support employees earlier in the process. Um, you know, one question I'd love to get your thoughts on, obviously, uh, you, you have a, a, a passion around the idea of getting people to be able to uh, come back into an office, come together, um, be, be, you know, be together in, in 3D or IRL or whatever term you want to <laughs> use for it, which we've heard them all by now. But uh, how do you like when I think about there was an interesting article and it, it kills me that I can't remember the, who actually wrote this so I can credit them appropriately. But they used an analogy of when e-commerce uh, really kind of took off and you could essentially everything that you used to go for a store for you could buy online and to get people to go back into a store storefronts had to really rethink the customer experience um, they had to redesign it they had to create yeah. it make it more appealing and attractive and compelling to give you a reason to actually go into a store and I think that analogy plays really well with you know a lot of the public kind of you know, pulls and, and tugs around getting employees back into an office. I think there's a lot of organizations uh, and leaders that are are wanting to kind of move, uh, you know, hastily in that direction. There's a lot of employees uh, who, you know, the vast majority prefer some level of hybrid um, construct. And so when you think about designing a workplace that draws employees back in, right, the, you know, yes, you can mandate it. Uh, but those don't always go well. So I, I think creating an experience that draws people in yep. uh, is is a great way to make that transition for employees. What does that look like to you? Like how can how can companies who are wanting to bring more of a, a massive of their employees uh, into the office, even with hybrid constructs, what can they do to kind of make that more compelling for those employees who've been working from home almost exclusively for going on two years now? Yeah. The first thing we did was try and understand what people can do at home that they can't do in the office. And so how are we making it so they're not missing anything? Um, and so we, you know, provide services. We have shuttle. We're looking at dry care, dry cleaning. Um, we put in care.com for our employees. Again, all of those things so that it, you wouldn't be, so you wouldn't be sitting there saying, I can't run errands. There's no one to take care of my family. Um, there's no one to, you know, we have a shuttle that comes from the East Bay because traffic is getting bad again. So that's one piece, right? How are we helping them get in the office? How are we helping them do those things that they would normally do if they were at home? So that's one. Two is what happens when you come in the office, right? Even something as... Um, as formal as we have someone sitting at the front desk, good morning, how are you, right? Like that feeling of warmth when you're coming back in. I mentioned the neighborhood. So you know when you're coming here, you're gonna sit with your team. You're gonna work cross-functionally with your team. We offer breakfast, lunch, and dinner sometimes, you know, for sure, breakfast and lunch. We have snacks. We do happy hours. Um, we do just in the middle of the day, come grab ice cream. Like we're trying to create a social environment that um, would allow them to feel like they're coming back to work. I think the most important thing though, Lars, is being intentional about the work they're gonna do. If people come in the office and sit on Zoom all day, there's no way you're gonna really convince them that they want to come in the office. 
So when we have folks in the office, we are coaching our managers on, this is when you do your team day. This is when you work cross-functional. This is when you put engineering and product in the same room to brainstorm with a whiteboard. Those are the days and you have to be intentional because if you're not, it is hard to make that case on why people should leave their house and come into the office. Yeah. I mean, you, you've, you've mentioned uh, training managers in several you know, elements yeah. of these conversations. And I appreciate that because I think so much of what we do, uh, and again, looking at kind of legacy HR is about, you know, we're going to create these policies and we're just going to push them out. And, you know, they're now how you all have to work, right? And like, <laughs> and that nobody work. wants to work. Yeah, it doesn't work. <laughs> it doesn't and nobody work wants to be told yeah, what to do. And it's like, you know, yeah. I think when you look at their role now, it's, it's how do we support our managers to drive these? Because really the yep. managers are the front lines. It's not HR. It's not people operations. So like, how do we support them? Because it, we're acknowledging that a lot of our managers are also experiencing these aspects of how we're working exactly. now for the first time. And so they need that guidance. It's not an embedded, um, you know, skill or discipline that they may have. Some of them may have never worked, you know, uh, remote or hybrid before yep. the pandemic, and they're still making those adjustments. So, And I agree um, 100%. It's in partnership with the HR business partners so that you can have the people team HR element of it. But then again, that training and coaching of the managers is what we found to work most effectively. Yeah. Well, Ned, I've really enjoyed learning about your your background, your career. I appreciate you making time to join the podcast. You know, we always end every episode with a lightning round to help I love the, this. I'm uh, ready. the listeners. Yes, you're ready. Okay, <laughs> so if you, we always start with music. So I'm checking out your Spotify or your you know streaming platform of choice. Uh, what, who will I learn are your top three artists? My top three: Kane Brown, number one; okay. Luke Combs number two, and Teddy Swims, number three. I listen to country music. Um, my late husband listened to country music way back in the day, like hardcore country. Um, but yeah, those are my three favorite. You know, it's funny. Country is a genre that I really have not spent a lot of time oh, with. I've got Hank we Williams. Could talk all day. I've got Hank. I've got, you know, I can go old school with that. But so you, no, you, you introduced three artists Kane I'm Brown. not familiar with. Kane Brown. You got to pick up Kane Brown. Kane Brown. Okay. Yeah. I'll check out Kane Brown. Uh, we'll, we'll move on to the screen. Uh, what was the latest uh, binge watch you saw? Uh, so I love action and adventure, and I watch the same movies over and over again. I would say binge watch is I watch the Equalizer um, TV show or Blue Bloods. I, I record them like I watch the first half of the season, then I record the second half so I could watch them all with some popcorn in the summer. But yeah. my favorite stuff is action and adventure kind of stuff or cops and robbers. You know, you, I, I don't and I, I, I know, so I will date myself with this answer, but uh, the original Equalizer. Yeah, 100%. Yeah, oh, okay, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. good, good. No, I, yeah. Yeah. We could talk that all day long, too. <laughs> that, was, that was a very solid, I haven't watched the new one yet, but it's kind of like, I feel like that was so classic, it's just like, ah, how do you, how do you I know, you but that? have you seen the movies? Because the Equalizer movies with Denzel Washington are fantastic, great binge, I've seen them like 10 times each, but then um, Queen Latifah does a good job, so you should watch yeah. that, too. Okay, I will, I, you're giving me more things to add to my list, so... Um, okay, you've worked in finance and tax. Uh, obviously, you're working in HR now. Those careers are no longer available to you. Uh, what would you do if you weren't doing those things? Music producer. Easy. Okay. Yeah. Country music producer? Country music. I would go work for Kane okay. Brown. That's yeah, well, my dream okay. job. <laughs> it's on my bucket list to go work for Kane Brown. <laughs> I feel like somebody has to send this podcast over to Kane just so he knows yeah. he's got, you know, he's, he's, my he's got some options. Yeah. yeah okay. Um, and then last question for you, uh, who is one HR leader who you admire and why? Oh gosh, so many. Um, my leader that I had at HP, her name's Tiffany. She is the person who I look up to and still think about what would Tiffany do. And the reason for that is because she was my first truly HR leader that was non-traditional. As you said, I've come up finance techs, all those I'm non-traditional. I don't think like other HR leaders because I don't have the same foundation. And she was the first one that I felt like got me and I got her. So um, yeah, her name's Tiffany. Great. Well, Annette, thanks so much for making time to share your career, your story and your work uh, with all the viewers. I appreciate it. And um, yeah, I appreciate the, uh, the tips on some new artists to check out as well. Great. Thank you.